Welcome to Let Me Know How It Is, a podcast about all things geek. We have another episode in the Spotlight series. Today, to celebrate its 30th anniversary, we spotlight the Warren Beatty movie, Dick Tracy. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe. You knew I was going to say it. All right, spotlight time, guys. This is our fourth one, actually. I love these episodes. These are some of my favorites to do. I'm Zach Slater. I'm Frank Melman. I'm Tommy Smithereens. I'm Clifton. All right, this week is the 30th anniversary of the release of the film Dick Tracy. Warren Beatty directed this movie in addition to playing the lead character of which the film is named. Al Pacino Madonna co-star, along with many, many others. The film is about famed police detective created by Chester Gold, who first appeared in newspaper comic strips back in 1931. The movie grossed $162.7 million, and that was in 1990 dollars. Today, that adjusts to approximately $319 million. So, all right, Dick Tracy, we're getting into it. So I hadn't obviously seen this movie since, well, not obviously, but I hadn't seen this movie since it first was in theaters, like back in 1990. My first impression was Danny Elfman needs to give back all the money that he was paid for Dick Tracy, because basically he cribbed all of the music from Batman 89 for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, he was probably told to do that. <laughs> probably was, but I mean, it's, it's, I mean, in some places it's note for note. You know, as many times as I've listened to that old 89 soundtrack, I'm like, my God, there's so much of this that is exactly like that movie. And I mean, I get it. It's We we can get into the heavily influence of, you know, movies that were big for comic books at the time, which there weren't many. But Batman 89 obviously was huge because they have all the Batmania stuff. But yeah, just watching the like from scene to scene in the opening, it sounded so much like that original soundtrack. Well, I mean, I think I, I think that there's definitely uh, a flavor to his music anyway. Like he may be the most easily pointed out uh, uh, movie uh, uh, score. Uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? My God, composer. composer. There we go. mm-hmm. yeah. Good grief. Way to go, Zach. Um, <laughs> not saying that is a bad thing. I'm just saying like he, his stuff is so identifiable, I think. But yeah, I mean, I thought the same thing, too. There's definitely like like a flavor of Batman 89 in here which i think there's probably going to be a lot of comparisons between the two right is 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 my prediction in this conversation i mean it's worth pointing out like you said that at the time this movie came out there were not a lot of comic book movies coming out they were pretty rare at this point and generally the ones that came out were kind of comic adjacent things they were not necessarily a comic book property it was more like a pulp character or a comic strip or something of that nature, like something that kind of smelled like it, but wasn't actually something appearing like by Marvel or DC. Right. Cause right after you get like the phantom and like the shadow rocketeer rocketeer. Yep. Yeah. It was stuff that was close or like comic strip when necessarily wasn't comic book. Yeah, yeah. Apparently like we mentioned before on a different episode that I think that's what they took from Batman 89 was not that people wanted superheroes, but they wanted like, 30s pulp characters so they mm-hmm. just started grabbing all of those so okay so uh we all rewatched this movie in preparation for this episode this is not a movie i watched a ton growing up like this my rewatch is probably my third or fourth time t- uh, seeing this movie and, and honestly it had been so long that it's kind of like watching it again for the first time like i didn't remember a lot of like sort of the plot twists and things of that nature mm. you know uh, but what's so what are your guys impressions, I guess, when you saw it like in the theater? Because I did not see this in the theater when I when I was a kid. Well, I mean, for me, it was I actually worked in a movie theater when the, when it came out. I was working in a movie theater when Batman came out. So I worked like the like those two summers were pretty big summers for movies. But I remember it was one of those things where like the lead up was pretty cool because they had like, you know, the 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 black. It was kind of the black classy uh, movie posters for it. And then it had just the image of like him with a Tommy gun or him with the, the wristwatch. And the buildup was kind of cool. And then they and show- the, the art that they did for those was pretty different in Darien at the time, that it was just very minimalist movie posters right. with just three colors. Right, exactly. And predominantly black. It was it was a pretty cool style, actually, in Darien at the time. Yeah, so f- from that, it was kind of like, oh, kind of excited. And Warren Beatty at the time was fairly still big, you know, a fairly big actor at the time because he had like, it's right around the time of like Bugsy, which is a great movie, and Bullworth, which is a great movie. So he had had a couple of hits and he was doing pretty well. And then there was talk of this. And like I said, it was, I remember the early trailers for it and it was just, you know, quick cuts and 
and it looked, you know, it was, you know, all the primary colors that are in it. And then, you know, Al Pacino <laughs> yelling, Tracy, Tracy, Tracy throughout the whole thing, <laughs> you know, and, and I remember people being excited for it. And then, but it's one of those things like we've talked about in other episodes where it's kind of like, it's a, it's definitely one of those first places. I feel like they're trading on nostalgia for a group that doesn't care. Like I felt like the people that were gonna that were gonna come watch it that that liked Dick Tracy, Dick Tracy or enjoyed Dick Tracy growing up in the comic strips weren't going to go watch this movie. <laughs> okay, interesting. I have nothing to say in regards to that. I mean that that was like that was your experience with it. Like I said, like I was a kid when this right. was out. Well, something I do remember about the movie when it was released is it did a midnight showing on its premiere night, like Batman eighty nine had done the year before. Mm-hmm. And and Frank might remember details about this because I remember the movie theaters. What they did is you could buy your tickets in advance mm-hmm. for the midnight showing of Dick Tracy, right? And you would get a T-shirt. That was your and ticket. your T-shirt <laughs> was your ticket into the movie, right? Like it was a Dick Tracy T-shirt, and then they would like stamp on it what your movie theater was, like where you bought it. And you had to wear that to your midnight showing to be able to see it. And I did see that when I was a kid. I was at the midnight showing of it. Yeah, that was one of the things where you, they were supposed supposedly they weren't supposed to sell like the night of. It was just supposed to be an advance ticket for just that showing, if I remember correctly. But yeah, it was it was I don't know, it was one of the things where it was like I think a lot of the fact like a lot of the hook for the movie was the fact that he was with Madonna at the time. Like they I were think dating. That, Actually, yeah, that yes. weren't, weren't baiting Madonna. Okay, that that's what I was trying to remember. I'm like, did they start dating after this, or 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 did they start, or were they already a couple when they when they were when they were making this movie? As far as I know, they were together, like together okay. when they started making it. And I think by the end of the time, like the actual movie comes out, they're not together again at that point. I don't remember that one very well. I just know that, but at some point they broke up. Obviously, my my memory of this is is really more about the marketing than it was about, like I said, I didn't see in the theaters, mm. but I remember this movie being everywhere. Right. So yeah, re- really quick going back to Batman 89. Like, it, like if you weren't around for that Batman 89, like Batmania swept the country. Yes. Like I saw Batman t-shirts on everybody, right. With adults to me, but really I was like teenagers. Right. You know what I mean? Like Batman t-shirts everywhere. And I remember I have a vivid memory of like going to Hallmark, the store, Uh right? With my mom. And there was a Batman section in Hallmark that had like Christmas ornaments and all kinds of stuff over there. My mom was like really into going there and stuff like that. So that was like, I love going there because it had a Batman section. So Dick Tracy was not that it was never like there there was never like sections in the supermarket for Dick Tracy, you know, (laughs) but I remember commercials for this all the time Mm -hmm. like growing up like so much so that i remember at seven when like which is my age at that time i was like even at seven i was like all right enough already good (laughs) grief i get it (laughs) like you know it was a fairly successful movie it was in the top 10 that year yeah well it it won it it was it was nominated for three oscars that's something i do like doing research for this i saw that it was nominated for three oscars and i think it no it won three oscars oh did it win three oscars (laughs) it won three oscars yeah well, I'm guessing for music. I'm guessing for original song. And I think makeup. And makeup. Yep. <laughs> right. Song, makeup, art direction. It all right. Right. Yeah, that, ma- that yep. makes sense. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, it was that. Steven Sondheim on music, so. Right. But yeah, no, I did like another quick story about the marketing. I remember, so th- you've heard me in past episodes talk about like my cousin would come and stay with us for the summer and everything. I remember like I was in summer school or something, maybe at seven. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and I came home. And my cousin had gotten to go to like Toys R Us. And instead of like a Ninja Turtles toy, he had like a Dick Tracy toy. Okay. And I was like, what? I'm like, what'd you get this for? Like, what is <laughs> right? He's like, I don't know. I just thought it, it looked cool. Right. And thinking back to it, like that toy line that came out for this movie, the commercials are amazing. I, like I, I, I watched a, a few of them recently, you know, uh, and I remember them being cool, even like because I didn't appreciate gangster stuff back then. at that Sure. Age. But now now that I love gangster stuff and i'm i love noir and everything like like i'm i'm dying for like to pick up some of these toys like like you know like off of ebay or something like they look like really cool figure i think i mean they were i was remembering there was um i was again doing some doing some research for this there was i, I remember the blank figure was pretty hard to get like it was a figure that was definitely like a chase figure that people were looking for from around that time 
And then right. the, other, the other one was, and I read this on, this is, this, when I, well, I'll, I'll give my source, I look at IMDb, and IMDb said that basically there was, um, was somebody the tramp, like somebody was like a, like a hobo or, you know, was a figure that they had released limitedly. And then people were upset at the time because it was bad. It was a bad look for homeless people. <laughs> so they, they stopped putting it out. So now it's one of those rare, rare figures where people, you know, pay thousands of thousands of dollars to get this. I think it's Steve, the tramp figure. Sure. <laughs> I remember, like, I remember the toy line was made by Playmates. So it was yes. the same people that did Ninja Turtles. But what was cool is that, because uh, my cousin bought the Dick Tracy one, and I mm -hmm. and he didn't have the yellow trench coat, which I always thought was weird. I'm like, why doesn't have the yellow trench coat? Right, which was all over the commercials at the time. But what was cool is like the accessories. Was he like that a they came gear? with? But they were actually like painted. It wasn't like the Ninja Turtle toys were like were like the the katana blades and the nunchucks were all like were all like brown. Like all of it was brown. But like right. his gun, the handle was like painted okay. different from like the barrel and stuff like that. And he had like holsters, like re removable belts and stuff that you could put him in. Well, what else and, was he going to have with guns? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I just thought like we'll post the commercials on on let me know how it is dot com so you guys could take a look at it. I mean, they they were really cool. And that was also like back in the time when like toy commercial had sets also, mm -hmm. you know, that you couldn't buy. Right. <laughs> but. Yeah, but all the neighborhood kids were, were were huddled around it playing with their Dick Tracy figures. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. Kids clamoring over prune face. Yeah. All the kids <laughs> were playing a poker game through the action figures on a little <laughs> poker table with like a knife in the middle of it. <laughs> right. Well, the funny, I mean, that's the funny thing. The other thing I noticed about watching this last night was the fact that it's supposed to be a kid's movie, right? Like, it's supposed to be. Okay. But, I mean, it's it's... Because I, I was I'm like, I had that weird moment of like, am I misremembering this? Was it not marketed for kids? And then I stopped, you know, I paused the movie and I'm like, well, it's PG. I'm like, okay. Right. But it's right around that time because PG-13 hadn't really been a thing so much. I mean, it would be like, you're talking like right around the time of like Gremlins and uh, uh, Temple of Doom is really when they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. These PG movies are really pushing the envelope between PG and blurring the line between PG and R. We might need another rate another rating between the two. And that's where we got PG 13. And I had that moment of like, why isn't this PG 13? Because it gets pretty violent. <laughs> like at the end, sure. I mean, at the end he's, you know, not to, we're going to spoil the crap out of this movie because it's 30 years old. But I mean, when he's just Tommy gunning people as they're driving out of the basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And not to mention the fact that like, I, again, I was like, had that moment when he goes back to, to breathless Mahoney to Madonna's dressing room and she's wearing basically a slip. Yeah. And you can like, you know, you can't, it's not like you can't make out what's going on underneath. Oh no. <laughs> like, like, yeah, there's, there's uh, air quote nudity in it for sure. Right. Right. Which, yeah, which that was the thing. Like, I do remember it being marketed for kids, but watching it, I'm like, this isn't so much a kid's movie, but the thing is, is that it has a lot of camp in it too. Sure. And so I think the camp can make it feel like a kid's movie. Right. <laughs> at times mm -hmm. and there's um, not blood per se like people get no. shot up all the yeah, time but true. we just don't see blood yeah right well the thing is it was it was it was uh buena vista which was an arm it was was an extension or, or outer extension of disney right it was buena yeah, vista touchstone was, as well mm -hmm. touchstone was another one right yeah but it was one of the things where i i kept remembering in my mind i'm like this is a like again when i get we haven't we haven't done the episode yet but like this is a disney movie it's quote unquote air quotes because I remember, and I when I did my research like, looking stuff up, there at one point when they first rolled out the trailer for it, it had the Disney logo in front of it. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. And then and then apparently because it was too racy, quote unquote, you know, because again, there's nudity and, and Dick Tracy just <laughs> Tommy gunning people to death, you know, and it as again bloodless death, but still there's death. Right. You know, they decided and people to back being away. cemented up and dropped into the river. Yeah. There's that too. They decided to back away from it. And it's not really a Disney thing. But the funny thing is, does anyone know what the short was that ran with it? Was it one of the Roger Rabbits? It is one of the Roger Rabbits. Yeah, okay. I was trying to remember what they <laughs> ran with. Because there were three of them, if I remember right. And they are, they're all on Disney Plus now, if you want to see them. It was Roller Coaster Rabbit was what was ahead of it. Okay. <laughs> that ran at the, at the front of it. So at one point, like I said, at one point, you know, when they, I guess when they looked at dailies or got the film back from what Warren Beatty was doing. They decided, no, we're not going to 
have the Disney stamp on it, but at the same time they put it with this kid cartoon short, which, <laughs> which I thought, I mean, maybe they're just trying to play off the idea. Oh, it's, you know, how they used to do things in the movie theaters right. where, you, where you would get all that stuff. And when you go see your movies, but it's still, it's an odd bit. Like I still think, and apparently there's also a Disney, I looked this up last night too. There's a behind the scenes Disney special. Like I think ran on, on like Disney channel in the day. Right. <laughs> Like it's got behind the scenes stuff and some makeup stuff, and it's got the kid from you know from the the Charlie Charlie Corsmo Charlie Corsmo is in it, and it, it's like all the stuff behind the scenes. And apparently they you know they they had talked about a sequel, but they did it more again as another say like Disney special where they just sort of looked at stuff of, of the the history of the character, and they talked to Warren Beatty and right yeah. So I guess yeah, I guess at one point like I said, Disney was all in, and then they're like, oh no. <laughs> that summer, the summer of 90 was when my family went to Disney World in Florida. Right. And the MGM Studios had been a fairly new attraction. It might have been open maybe a couple of years by that point. I can't remember exactly when it opened, but it was still new down at Disney World. And they like were pushing Dick Tracy hard there. Right. Like they had sets on display that were used in the movies. Like they had you know, costumed people as the Dick Tracy characters. They had the cars from the set, like around MGM studios. Like they were pushing it very, very hard there. I have pictures of all this stuff somewhere. Clifton, did they have like, a, like I, the other thing I found was it looked like they had like, you know, they stage those, like they'll, they'll have those stage shows at right. Disney. Did they have one? Do you remember? That I cannot remember for sure. I do remember going to the Indiana Jones one they did there. Well, of course I did that year. too. But I do remember seeing, like, I can picture possibly one. I'll have to go back and see if I remember for sure. Because it looked like, the, again, on, on either on YouTube, I think it's on YouTube, there's there's footage of people. It looked like they were doing, like, kind of like the Newsies bit of, right. you know, people singing and dancing, and, you know, in that yeah. and around the Great Depression. Right. So I didn't know if it was Dick Tracy because it came up when I was looking for the Dick Tracy Disney special. It may have been because I remember seeing like the whole like a whole city block from the movie was on MGM Studios at the okay. at the park at that time and they might have done stuff there like reenactment kind of with some song and dance jeez <laughs> very cool but yeah so disney definitely was was pushing it in the summer of 90 gotcha so uh, going into like actually the movie though i think for me one of the things that stands out, one of my favorite things about the movie is is the set pieces to this. I think this movie has such an amazing, unique look, right? Mm-hmm. And Clifton, going back to our untapped potential episode where you had brought up uh, uh, Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay as like a miniseries. And we were talking right. about how would you do the superhero uh, escapist stuff that they write in the books and everything, and I said right. like it would be cool if it looked like the Batman and Robin stuff, but it would also <laughs> right, right. be cool if it looked like this movie. Yeah, I actually did think about that when I was watching it, ramping up for this. I did think of your comment and be like, no, like this is how they can do it to differentiate, just like an embellished version of their own time period. Yeah, and that's unapologetically artificial. No, I, yeah, I, I absolutely like I love the vivid colors of it all and everything, but there appears to be a lot. Uh, I, I don't know a whole lot about the making of it, but it, it looks like a lot of matte paintings. It is. Yeah, it's definitely a lot right? of matte paintings. It's one of the things where it's it, again, and, and I took this from IMDb looking at research stuff. Again, it was one of those things where there it's it's we're right at this point in filmmaking. We're right on the cusp of like everything is CGI after this point. It's one of those. Not, not I'm not saying like this is like a historic moment in filmmaking, but I'm just saying this is one of the last movies that are are, are you know done with mad painting. And they said that basically he had to tell them not to move the camera left to right because it would show that it was more of more to be more showing of it being a matte painting. So it's a lot of panning in and panning out, <laughs> and very right. carefully moving for, across the scenery so that you wouldn't really know that it's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. I, to me, I, I mean, completely unironically, I think it's a beautiful looking movie. I really do. I think, I think it's, it's truly unique. And I think that there is a, a fun, uh, uh, his rogues gallery, right? Where like you have normal people walking around as extras and stuff in the background of the, of, of the, of the frame, but like the bad guys are all done with makeup and they're all kind of like in these baggy, like colorful suits and everything. And they look, there's like an artificiality to how they look. Is that a word? Artificiality? Yes, I don't know. Sure. But, uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like there, there's, there's a way that like you can tell that it's makeup, 
for like prune face and flat top and stuff like that. So they stick out and everything. But there's some care put into it that like I'm surprised they thought he thought of this. Like there's people in the background. Occasionally you'll find just like a random guy with like a prosthetic nose mm-hmm. right. or something on it just to kind of make it like a little cohesive that like no like there's people in that world that you know just have like these e- exaggerated features. features. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean I I mean that's something I would definitely give that movie and again that's why it's probably won the Oscar was the fact that you know for trying to recreate that rogues gallery that that Dick Tracy had, you know, which some people definitely argue influenced, you know, Batman's Rose Gallery a lot was was the fact that they nail a lot of what visually what those characters look like. I think that's one of the things that that movie excels at. I think it's amazing. I don't I don't know if so much if I, I would call it a beautiful movie. I think it does a good job of trying to make make use of the idea that comics are primarily primary colors and all that kind of stuff. But there are parts of that are like for me, at least, you know, you're, real, you're you may think differently, obviously. But to me, it was a little bit, you know, I, I didn't remember it being quite so striking in scenes. As you know, quite being mm-hmm. you know, everything is you know. I remember this. I remember the the figure, the, like the actors and stuff, looking very, you know, everyone's in a primary color or a secondary color suit. And I remember the makeup, but I didn't realize the sets were quite that you know, not really grounded in reality because they wanted to up you know, basically up the the ante for the comic book or comic strip look, I should say. Yeah, but that's the beauty of it to me is that like is that it is artificial and i think it, I, I like another movie that i think tried to in some way kind of ape a comic aesthetic on screen was hulk the ang lee hulk right. you know what i mean and we can argue you know to what effect he was to what degree he was successful or unsuccessful or whatever, but i think warren Beatty's like really successful here on this i mean I, I you know again i didn't see it in the day so i don't know like what effect it had to movie going audiences then Mm. But like, I still, today, I still think it looks tremendously unique, you know? And I think, I think that even with green screen technology, you can do this kind of similarly today, possibly more cost effectively and still achieve this, this cool look to me. Mm. That's just me, but you know, I think it's air apparent is like 2004 Sin City. Yes. Yeah. I think that's yeah. like its most that's its that. most uh, direct descendant, I believe. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good point, Clifton. Yeah. Definitely. No, for for sure. No, I and no, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I I was also thinking Sin City watching this movie. I'm like, I don't know why. Like I just like I I can't shake the feeling that there's that there's some similarities. The other one here that that I will bring up that nobody has uttered in years and years and years is Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow that I think was also <laughs> yeah, right. kind of done yeah, similar shout out to right, my brother, right. who I think we're the only two people that like that movie. <laughs> I like it. I saw it in the theater. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I saw yeah. it. Yeah. My my brother and I saw it with our engineer, I remember. Like uh, yeah, I was I couldn't wait for that movie. Yeah. But no, I just think I like I, I love the look of it, clearly. I mean, I can't say enough great things about it. I th- I think I think uh I could watch this movie with the sound off and just be and just be happy with the pictures. Uh, you know? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I go ahead go ahead no uh, i was gonna say the the feeling i get from this movie is not so much the nostalgia that you guys shared for it or even with sky captain oh my god i remember seeing that movie and i was it just felt it went on too long like i would have loved that movie <laughs> in like 10 minute bursts we'll, but we'll it, post the trailer to sky captain because i know none of you know what we're talking uh, no, about <laughs> no i remember it vividly because it took me like five times to actually watch the whole movie because I kept falling asleep during it. Even <laughs> when I paid money to go see it at the movie theater. But for this, it seems like they I wish that they had the same energy that the original strip had in which it made it felt like it was it took itself seriously, which I didn't think this one did to a certain extent. No. It's like they kept they tried to capture the children, but I felt it was a comic that was for mostly adults i mean even though it ran in a daily strip i get that but it didn't it didn't um give itself a comedic feel the comedy right. was in the um the um absurdity of its villainy mm. Every, everything other than that it felt like you know those those noirs that uh you um zach so vividly love i yeah. wish i wish they did it like that but i think I mean, that's an interesting point, because I think I think some of that's there. 
I think that there is some sincerity in this movie. You think? As, uh, yeah, I do. I because I think, I, I think that, I think Warren Beatty has an affinity for Dick Tracy, the the property. Uh-huh. First mm-hmm. of all, I yep. I I I think I think he, it's something that's very close to him. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think my assumption is that he also likes the noir detective movies of the forties and the fifties and stuff like that. And there are moments in there that I think he is trying to flex that muscle and evoke that kind of film, because there are things in there where like the exchanges between uh, Tracy and breathless and stuff like that. Like that stuff is, is, you know, straight out of it's pretty the forties noir stuff, <laughs> just kind of just amplified a little bit. No, 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 you're right. But it's the you know? colors. Like, like for one scene when he's on the uh, like the balcony or the roof, mm-hmm. and an explosion happens, this man is wearing a a, a yellow overcoat. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's yeah. like you're, you're you're doing a stealth thing right now with the big yellow yeah. overcoat on. You know, <laughs> it's like you can see him at night with no street lights on, and you can point to him right at the roof. So I mean, <laughs> I, I it's just it's the I mean I love the colors, but oh my god, <laughs> it just doesn't play. It doesn't play with it. Oh my I'm gosh. gonna I'm gonna point out something about the '40s noir movies, and admittedly, this is a complete reach. And okay. I know he's not doing this, but I'm just gonna throw it out there, though. The black and white noirs, though, apparently, uh, because they weren't making these in color, clearly, they knew that there was gonna be gray tones and everything like that. And so on set, sometimes you would see them in gaudy colored suits that mm-hmm. you would normally never wear in real life because of the shade of gray. That mm. it that that it read as when it was done in black and white. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Different values in the black and white. Yeah, you can see, look up, find photos of the Adams family house in color, because it was shot for black and white, and the like. And you see it in color; it's all like bright pink and green and garish, <laughs> just because of the values they wanted it to have in black and white. Yeah. So I'm not saying that that's what that that's what he's going for, but it would be cool if it was. The, the yellow is kind of an interesting thing to me because I, I've never read a Dick Tracy comic strip in my life and everything. Really? So, I mean, so was he was the yellow trench coat taken from there and was it intentionally yellow or was it one of those was it one of those like Marvel Hulk printing things where like it was supposed to be like a regular looking trench coat and it just kind of printed as yellow because because of the 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 inks back then do you guys know i remember always thinking it was a trademark yellow dick yeah. tracy trench coat okay yeah. it wasn't quite, i mean it wasn't quite that primary it was more of like a you know it'd be a little softer mm. yeah. but i mean i mean that's one of the that's one of his trademarks in the hat and then the obviously the transistor watch um the radio that was definitely you know another thing and the fact that i'm surprised they didn't do it along the lines of having something pointed out because it was always pointed out in the in the comic strip, they would have like a like not like a word balloon, but would have like a uh, a narration balloon that would just basically you know illustrate whatever like it would say transistor watch or transistor radio watch, and then it would you know point to whatever it is. That was something else they did. But yeah, I agree with I agree with Tommy the idea that you know well I get I mean I I think the idea of him you know sliding up the side of a building in this yellow trench coat that no one would see yeah I mean you know would be something. <laughs> but I I also at the same time agree with Zach the idea that I think he has. A sincerity and likes the character but i think part of the problem with the, the with the with the character is he's playing it straight and it's not straight like hey i'm making a movie about dick crazy he's just playing it so rigid and so straight and everyone else is like playing it over the top camp i think a yes. lot of i think a lot of the problem with for me with it was um and, and this might be something i'm i'm remembering from the time or remembering about reading about dick crazy was that everyone saw batman 89 and saw how much fun nicholson was playing the Joker, you know, how much he was with the role and was being able to do all that fun stuff and said, you know what, that can translate to any villain that I put on in a comic book movie. Sure. No, I, 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 I do think that Jack Nicholson had a, his influence was immense. Mm -hmm. Right. For, for that kind of movie. I mean, especially, I mean, look no further than Batman and Robin and Batman forever. We're like two face is the Joker. Right. And the Riddler is the Joker and Mr. Right. Freeze is the Joker. Right. <laughs> right. right. Like they're right. all, they're all doing it. Um, I don't disagree with you, Frank. I mean, I think, I, I think that that possibly played into it, but the thing that gets me is I wouldn't this have been in production already by the time like Batman came out. 
Um, I would assume it would have been in production while Batman was released. Yeah, I would think okay. so too. I would think so too. Okay. I think, I mean, I don't disagree with you. I mean, th- there, there is a weird mashup of acting styles here. Yes. And, yes. <laughs> but, but what I will to, say, to be kind. Yes. There no, are. but what I will say, I think it's completely intentional. I think it's absolutely completely. I, I, I don't think, See, I, I don't think it's one of those things of Warren Beatty being like, well, I'm going to, I'm. I have I'm trying to make this movie and Al Pacino shows up on set and he's like, I have this idea for the movie because all the bad guys are played uh, like that. Uh, well, uh, that's a funny that you mentioned that there, Zach, because when I was looking at the idea of, of how they were doing the makeup for everything again, like, this is, goes back to the IMDb stuff that I saw. There's a point where they say, you know, that all of the characters were designed, you know, by this one guy who won, I guess, who won the Oscar for 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 the character design. And. They, you know, they all, everyone basically said, okay, fine. And they had their makeup. Big boy, the, the one that's, that's uh, Al Pacino's character, he designed his own makeup. Okay. Yeah. And it's one of the things where Al Pacino is, I mean, Al Pacino, I'm sorry, as much as I, you know, I, I enjoy the guy's performances and love his work. There's not, I mean, to tell me that there's not an ego involved with, well, that's great. The guy that's eventually going to go on to win the Oscars designed all these characters, but I'm going to say, this is what I'm going to wear in a movie directed by Warren Beatty. I have a hard time believing that there wasn't some influence on how the character was played too. No, I, but what what I'm saying though is I think I think Warren Beatty chooses to play Dick Tracy very naturalistic, right? Like he's he's not really like chewing up the scenery much or anything like that. Like he's playing it pretty pretty straight laced, mm-hmm. right? And Dick Tracy's supposed to be like this tough, no nonsense cop, and I think that performance. Put up against Al Pacino's like grandiose, like like um, big boy who is like you know as the movie comes on like he's he's coming apart at the seams, especially like at the end of the movie, like like he's really kind of like losing it. And I think the rest of the bad guys also because I'm thinking of um, oh, I'm blanking on I'm blanking on the guy's name, um, not Flat Top, the blonde guy that runs around with Flat Top all the all the time. That's played by the guy from Lethal Weapon. You know what I'm talking about? Hang on. Let me look him up really, really quick. I got it right here. <laughs> it, it, he is played by Ed O. Ross. Okay. He plays Itchy, the blonde guy. Right. right? right. The guy who does like, like, you know, the, the woman's voice when he's uh-huh. knocking on Dick Tracy's door. Right. 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 That guy. Like, right. he's absolutely like playing it like to, to the balcony, mm-hmm. too, you know? Sure. And I think I think that that is I think that is an acting choice that's intentional to go along with the gaudy stylized look of all the bad guys. Right? Mm-hmm. Because the kid also plays it pretty straight. Sure. The kid who is essentially, you know, uh the protege of Dick Tracy plays it like Warren Beatty. Mm-hmm. Kid's very straight-laced, right? <laughs> like you get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I see what you're saying. I mean, it's one of the things where I get it. I mean, you're playing the, 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 the basically, if you want to emphasize the idea that the gangsters are larger than life and that Dick Tracy's not, I understand. But it's one of those things where, like I said, just looking at some of the notes about stuff about the movie, I'm like, eh, well, I mean, and from other stuff I've read about Al Pacino, it's not like, <laughs> like I said, I just felt like it was one of those things where he's so rigid and so, like, there's not a lot of room to get. Like I felt like as a, as rewatching it again, I felt like there wasn't a lot of inroads to Dick Tracy as a character. It's kind of like he just is a lawman and that's it. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then everyone else is just sort of like tearing things up scenery wise, you know. So I mean, but the other yeah, thing, but the he's other- the director also though. I mean, that's the, that that's the thing that I can't separate from it is that like, th- like this idea that like he lost control of his movie. Well, no, I didn't say you know? that. I didn't say that. I'm just saying, in particular, the fact that, again, when when again the guy, uh, like my example was the fact that the guy that that went on to win the Oscar was basically told, "No, that's okay. I know better." By an actor, mm. that's what I'm trying to get across. And right. if that's if that's the decision that the actor made about his costuming. I guarantee you that that actor probably made the same same outroads to Warren Beatty about, "Well, that's all well and good, Warren. I'm going to play it the way I want to play it." Because a lot of that movie doesn't seem like to me that it's 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 it, it doesn't seem like it's one of those things where people stuck to the script either. There definitely seems like not Warren Beatty, but other people like the, the villains 
especially Pacino, especially the, the climax of the movie when he's got her like tied up to the the wheel. It's very awkward. Like it doesn't seem like it's written. It just seems like people are just spouting dialogue. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I do think that that. But I also think that's why Al Pacino did the movie. I, th- well, I think I think that he saw this as an avenue to, to I think he's having a, a lot of fun playing this character because, well, I do. I think he's awesome in this movie. I really do. Well, I think a lot of it had to do with, again, I think it goes back to Nicholson because Nicholson was the Joker and you said his, his, his influence was immense. But I also think that a lot of people thought, well, this is the ticket now that, mm-hmm. you know, because Nicholson had that sweetheart deal where he got paid a ton of money to do it and then got like a percentage of everything. Yeah. Right. Which is insane. Which yeah. is insane. When, when you think about the amount of money that Nicholson made off of 89 and the fact that there was never a sequel regardless, I mean, he, you know, he, I mean, granted he made a ton of money off the first and didn't really have to do anything after he could do anything he want after that. But I, I think that again, because of the influence of Batman 89, there was definitely this idea of, well, you're going to get an A-list actor to play, to play a super villain or a villain in these movies now. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing, too. I mean, like, I, I would I've forgotten how many people were in this movie. Too. There's a ton. Look, there's a, ton. There's, there's there's a, huge a cast. lot of people in this movie. Um, I remembered Pacino and, and, you know, this is Madonna at like the height of her powers and all of that stuff, too, right, and everything. Right. And she plays it very right much the way Vogue. that you would expect you, you would expect her at that time to play this sort of character. Right. But mm-hmm. like and I remember Dustin Hoffman. Right. Sure. But I didn't remember that, like, James Caan is yeah, in this. In the small role, too. Yeah. Yeah, super small role. And Paul Sorvino's in this. Yes. And um, uh, Manny Patinkin, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Pretty big role for him. Pretty big sure. role for him, yeah. And, and he, his character's an interesting choice, too, mm-hmm. I think. Because 88 Keys, right? There's no, there's no makeup done to him. No. Right. He doesn't he doesn't have an exaggerated look nope. at all. Um, he doesn't have a thing. Right. He doesn't have a giggle. He doesn't have something to his character. Right. He's just a piano player. Just a piano player. But as you as as the movie's unfolding and you're seeing that he has a bigger role. Right. And and he's a little bit more crucial to the story than than you were led to believe from his first scene in the movie. Right. Right. He starts to like as he's in these scenes with the gangsters and everything, and he's kind of like unfolded into the character that 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 he becomes by the end of the movie. He does have like a weird laugh that's introduced like in that scene. And suddenly it gives him like a thing. It gives him like an exaggeration because it's not a normal laugh. It's like it's Mm -hmm. like a weird cackle. Mm -hmm. Right. Did you guys catch this? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, In the the conference room. Yeah. In the the conference conference room room with with the rest of the mobsters and everything. And right. so, so he has no prosthetics. He doesn't look like the rest of them, but it introduces like a weird, you know, uh, um, a weird exaggeration to his character to suddenly put him like in line with the rest of those characters. And it is, it is when they accept him. Cause it's after, uh, Dick Tracy has been framed for murder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and he set it up. Yeah. Yes. After Dick Tracy has killed Dick Van Dyke. Yeah. <laughs> right. oh, yeah. And I totally yes. forgot Dick Van <laughs> yeah. Dyke was Thank in you. it. Yeah. I, I completely forgot Dick Van Dyke was too. in this movie. I absolutely did. Yeah. The, and the fact that Dick, Dick Van Dyke is sort of playing a heavy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, is a, which is a great bit because that never happened. Right. Right. But yeah, getting back to people that are in this, do you know that, who the sonographer was? Mrs. Green? Yeah. Oh, Kath- uh, Kathy yeah. Bates. Right. Yeah, yeah. Kathy Bates yeah. is in this. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine O'Hara is in this too, which I didn't even catch. I had to like, no. look, I was looking up, I was looking up who played Flat Top. Right. And then I was like, Catherine O'Hara is in this movie. Like, where is she? Like, I missed her <laughs> completely. <Yeah. laughs> well, the funny yeah. thing is, like, like I was looking at like I kept seeing like people in the background. I'm like, I know that guy from stuff. And yeah. like, for example, one of the cops is Cole Meany. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cole uh, Meany. Yeah. O'Brien. From, yeah. Cole, yeah. Uh, uh, Miles O'Brien from TNG and from uh, later for more from Deep Space Nine. And then a couple of the porters. One of them is this guy, John Shuck. Does anyone know who John Shuck is? He was like, he's a character. I've been in a million things. But around the same time, when they tried to revolve, re, uh, revive the Munsters with Munsters today, he was Herman Munster. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah, he's one of the reporters that when Big Boy does his, does his, uh, uh, what's the gangster that, uh, it's, sure, again, getting back to Batman 89, it's uh, your uncle, you know, it's your old uncle Bingo, time to pay the check. That bit when he's running, when Big Boy's walking down the steps. One of the reporters is this guy, John Chuck. The other one that I thought was interesting was Charles Fleischer. Anyone know who Charles Fleischer is? No. You should know. Zach, for sure. 
Okay. But Charles Fleischer is the voice of Roger Rabbit. Oh, no <laughs> kidding. Yeah, Charles Fleischer didn't have a line in the movie, but he's right there with John Chuck next to him, like basically with like a, you know, the old school pen and pad, you know, writing down what Big Boy's saying. I was like, oh, Charles Fleischer. And then I did the research about this short. And I'm like, well, that makes a little bit of sense. I guess he was, you know, they grabbed him for it or whatever. Right. But yeah, it's kind of, it was, it was an interesting tidbit. Um, who else? Oh, and then of course, Strickland, being, Strickland for Back to the Future that is in there too. <laughs> <laughs> right. numbers. Yes. And then, the other one that, that that I that I noticed right off the bat was uh, was Robert uh, Robert Costanzo. Oh yeah, yeah. Robert Costanzo yeah. is 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 uh, is Lips Detective is, Bullock. Yeah, he's bodyguard. He's he's Bullock yeah. from from Batman the Animated Series was in it too. So yeah, there's and a the, ton of and people. And the in police there. chief is uh, the police chief is played by the guy who plays the priest in Everybody Loves Raymond. Charles Durning. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> well, Charles Durning was great at it too. But yeah, but it was so many the, people in this movie. So many Good people. Grief. In this movie. What the, one of the other things I thought was that was was kind of odd, but uh, you know, because I don't think w- while we have this whole like triangle between Brothers Mahoney and Dick Tracy and and Tess Trueheart, I thought it was I've always thought it was odd, even from the beginning that Glenn it's Glenn Headley, right? Is that her name? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that Glenn Headley is 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 playing Tess Trueheart. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Glenn Headley in a lot of stuff. Like I think my favorite thing with her is if you've never seen Dirty Rotten Scoundrel, she's phenomenal in it. Oh she, yeah. But I like her in a lot. I mean, I liked her in a lot of movies. She's she passed away, I think, four or five years ago. But she was she was. It was one of those things where even when I, even when I saw it back in in, in nineteen ninety, I thought there's not a lot of chemistry between the two of them. Did anyone else feel that way? Um, I mean, I, I it was kind of like he he couldn't part of the character. He couldn't talk to her, but that was part of the character, right? Yeah, that I think it was like he couldn't communicate. Yeah. So there was that, but I think it was intentional. I got that, but it's one of those things where, I mean, you know, Madonna's like slinking all over the desk, lighting the place on fire, and obviously he's <laughs> responding. He's obviously he's obviously responding to that because you know right. they were whether you know it's Madonna or the fact that it's Madonna and they're together in real life. Right. But Tess you heard it was kind of like I mean, don't get me wrong. There's some cool scenes like with her and the kid where she's trying to play it off that she's got a little more going on than just being, you know, his his backup choice or whatever. Yeah. But what I, again in doing my in doing looking stuff up apparently sean young was was chosen for test true heart to begin with <laughs> yeah oh wow which again I heard that too which again goes back to batman 89 because originally she was supposed to be vicky vale or no no <laughs> sorry she was supposed to be catwoman that's what it was for batman returns and she was she got into an accident she got a horse ri- horse riding accident that they didn't even shoot like it was a scene they were supposed to shoot and she broke her collarbone she couldn't be catwoman but for whatever reason um they didn't end up using her for dick tracy that she claims it was it was Warren Beatty came onto her and she said no, and then Warren Beatty says no, nah, she just wasn't right for the picture. So you know you don't know who you believe, but it was one of those things where I thought it was weird that maybe that's the reason why that they just brought in Glenn Headley and said okay, put her in the picture. Yeah, no, that that stuff I don't know for sure. Like uh, I remember the Sean Young Batman stuff. I, mm-hmm. I, I remember I remember that, but yeah, the I Warren think- Beatty definitely does have like a track record at that point of hooking up with his co-stars because by the time Dick Tracy came out was when Bugsy was in production. And I believe that had Annette Benning in it. Right. And that's, and I think that's when they got together. Oh, right. Okay. (laughs) That's right. I forgot about that too. Yeah. I don't know much about Warren Beatty because this was like, you know, I've seen maybe four of his movies total, you know what I mean? But, (laughs) but I do think, again, I think, um, I think the, the dynamic between him and Tess again is completely intentional. I think I I think that weird uh, uh, sort of like uneasiness between them does lend the audience on first viewing to be like, well, is he is he going to like shack up with Madonna? Right. Is he stepping out? Is he stepping out? Right. Exactly. I think Mm -hmm. I like that's like I I just I'm subscribing to the idea. I think much more of this movie is intentional than 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 maybe you guys think or, or, you know, Frank or Frank and Tommy think. I, t- I totally think that there just was no chemistry between them. They don't even, there's not even like, there's not even a push pull. There's not even like the, the, the will they won't lay. I'm like, well, who cares? There's, this is pretty, you know, I mean, I get, th- again, I get that he's supposed to be the upright, you know, upright standing citizen, you know, lawman. And that she's supposed to be, it's in her name. She's Tess Trueheart. She's not going anywhere, even though she goes someplace, you know? Yeah. But, but again, what I'm saying though, I think, I think the, the, I think it's intentional that there's a little bit of lack of chemistry there. Right. Because I think it's supposed to feel somewhat cold and awkward anyway. Mm-hmm. 
right? Like I, I like I, th- I think I think that's the hook of it. I, th- I think that's what he's going for, right? Okay, is that well, is he, that he is that for- it is that like is that it makes you go, oh well, he's got the, like they don't really have a relationship, right? Because it it is nuanced in the sense that like he does clearly care for her. I think that comes through, and I, and it, and it's not one of those things where like it comes through because it's in the script, right? Like I think I think that that there is something in their play together that there is that there is a genuine care for each other. But at the same time, it's they're kind of the couple that sits across from each other at breakfast and doesn't really have anything to say because like they've heard everything already, you know? <laughs> well, so I mean, I, I mean, I could say I'm sure there was some intentionality in the fact that, you know, it's one of those is it, it will they or won't they. But I also think that as actors, there's not a lot of chemistry between the two of them when they do decide to to swing the pendulum back the other way to be like, well, we're going to get together. I'm like, no, nah, you're not. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't, no, I don't, it's I don't, not, I don't, it, it's I don't not, buy that. It, they're not burning up the screen. No, no, it's not. But no, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, but, again, again, she's not like, again, I'm not, I'm not saying anything against her. Cause it's not like, I, I think she's, you know, she's not, a, she's not, she couldn't play the part. I'm just saying it's one of the things where I think it's an odd choice for, you know, for Dick Tracy. That's all I'm saying. No, I, no, I get it. But again, I'm saying though, like, like on my, like, I just disagree completely. Okay. Like, because spoil the movie, like the ending, right. When he proposes, like, how does he propose? It's just as awkward. It just as <laughs> right. Uh, 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 like disconnected as the rest of all of their scenes together. He just chucks the ring at her on his way out the door. <laughs> He doesn't even ask her. He's like, like the second earlier, he's like, uh, 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 and he can't get the I, words out. But that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't, again, I don't see that there's not, <laughs> that's my point. Like I'm saying, yes, it is. But like, I don't see the reason why he's proposing there. I mean, there's not really been a point where they've had a turning point where suddenly like, you know, woo, they had a barn burner. And now everything's, you know, it's a totally different world. It's kind of like, eh, well, things are still the same. I got to go serve my, you know, lady justice, you know? No, and, and I I'm, know. No, I get I get that, but but I but just from what I said earlier though, like I do think that there is a nugget in there of of that they care for each other. And I think to me that comes through. Mm. And that comes through in a way that's not just like it's not just in the dialogue and it's not just in a it like I said, like it's in the script and that way and we're supposed to go with it. Like I think I you know, I think that there is something there mm. between them. I'm 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 not saying that it's that it, it's huge chemistry, but like I said, I think it's designed to not be very big. I just think it don't be chemistry. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just don't. No, we, we didn't mention anyone who, who wrote the movie because the people who wrote the script were the writers of Top Gun. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and also, I mean, and this, this is apparently one of those movies that apparently had been like in development since the seventies. Right. Like, like, I mean, like this, this went across like Spielberg's desk at some point, like, and he was attached to it and passed on it. Like the, like the, the amount of people that this went to before Warren Beatty got it and was interested in doing it was insane. You know, yeah. It was an insane, like De Niro was attached to, to play yeah. big boy at one point. Yeah. You know, Gene Hackman was supposed to be in this movie. He, yes. he, I, that one I didn't hear, but I did hear that, that, um, before Warren Beatty got it, that like Harrison Ford was attached to play the character and Richard Gere and, uh, you know, and other guys like, um, uh, uh, Tom Selleck, you know, like, th- like those types <laughs> of actors in the day yeah. were also attached to, like, you know, the Mel Gibson, I think was another one. Yeah. yeah. One of the, one of the things I read about Gene Hackman was he said that he was interested in it up until the point that he found that Warren Beatty was involved and he said that. He so much he so much disliked his working with Warren Beatty on the movie Reds, Reds yeah. that he would never he would never consider working with him again. Danny Elfman said the same thing. He said working with Warren Beatty, Warren Beatty's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and Warren Beatty had that reputation as an actor too. Directors didn't like working with him either. Yes. Yeah, and also so. too another another nugget. Macaulay Culkin was supposed to play the kid, but At he one opt- point. yeah he opted out oh, to really? play guess to play guess what film. Ooh! Yeah. <laughs> Came out the same year. Yeah, my girl. Yeah, that's that's it. My yeah, girl, my girl, Richie Rich. <laughs> yes. No, yes. and the kid that was in this was like all over the place for two years. He, he was. was in like eight movies in two years. In two he was. Years, yeah, he's in Hook, right? Yeah, yeah. he's yes. in Hook. Yes. But what's crazy too is what's the name? Scorsese was supposed to um direct the film after Bob Fosse turned it down. Yeah. This was. 
Guess what Scorsese directed that? Yeah. This is great. <laughs> Good I know this. Good fellas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you imagine if we yes. not get Good fellas because of uh, uh, Dick Tracy? <laughs> uh, God. How much cursing would be in this movie, though? Oh, Scorsese oh my did gosh. It. Oh, I would love to see a <laughs> well, Scorsese. See, what's funny is I watched The Irishman. And like I felt like the Irishman was a grim and gritty update of Dick Tracy because it also had <laughs> Al Pacino in makeup playing oh, a really? super villain. That's I did not know that. That's funny. I gotta check that out. It's just he plays Jimmy Hoffa in, I got, in the I gotta, Irishman. I gotta check it out now. Like like I, I I gotta take a week off of work and watch the Irishman. <laughs> it but takes the, a while. <laughs> yeah. But the funny thing is, you gotta like, commit to that one. But Nicholson played Hoffa too, right, in the Danny DeVito movie. Did he? Uh, yeah, I've never seen that one. I've never seen it either. I remember seeing it on like blockbuster shelves and stuff like that. Wow. Like next Old to the you. next to the two Jakes. Yes. <laughs> two Jakes is a good movie. But um, I never saw it. Oh, okay. Have you seen so, Chinatown? I've seen Chinatown, absolutely, okay. for sure. Right. <laughs> okay. It's not it's not as good, but if you like if you like Nicholson and you like Jake Giddits, it's, it's a good movie. Mm-hmm. But um yeah, it's one of the things where he played because now I'm getting back to the whole thing of Nicholson and Pacino, and I guess, you know, the idea that, well, he played Hoffa, so I guess that Pacino felt he needed to play Hoffa too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, I, I, it was the other thing I noticed about it that, um, along with the fact that they were, there was, it's just so many people, is the idea that, you know, all the connections of other things, like you, like you were saying, Tommy, the idea that, um, we wouldn't have got Goodfellas, but the idea that you have a sort of a Godfather reunion. Oh mm-hmm. yes, yes. Because you have, because you have um, Jimmy Khan and then Al yeah. Pacino. Um, yeah, it's Sonny yeah. and Michael. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Which I thought was, a, which I thought was a fun bit. The idea that that happened, but like you know, all the little cameos that 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 are in it. Like I said, I never would have again the idea that we got Home Alone, but Catherine O'Hara goes on to play the mom in that. But you know, we didn't get Macaulay Culkin. It's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. No, I like I. I I enjoyed this movie a lot more this time around than I think when I initially saw it. I just cause I I've, I've, I've listened and, and seen more things now. Right. Like I, like I got into noir since the first time I was into this, I, I, I watched this movie. Right. And, and I think I've learned a little bit more about movie production and stuff like that now. And so like, like I'm impressed with it. I, I it's not a perfect movie, but it's one of those, th- this is a guilty pleasure of mine. Is, is basically what I'm saying. Like, it's in that category now. I, I, I do think the movie loses a little traction, like like not even midway through a little like three quarters of the way through. I think I, I think they kind of don't quite know where to go for a little bit. You know what I mean? I would never watch this movie again. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I have no. a soft spot for it myself. Yeah, it's one of those. It's one of those where I'm like, I had that movement. Like when we we talked initially about let's let's do this. Let's 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 do this. You know, this anniversary <laughs> episode on Dick Tracy. I'm like, well, I remember seeing it and I remember not hating it, <laughs> but I couldn't remember. Well, then I mean, most stuff that I you know anyone who knows me knows if I like anything, I've watched it a million times, right? So. It's one of the things where like I kept trying to think, why didn't I why I've never watched this movie again? And I got into this movie watching it, the rewatch and went, Oh, this is why. <laughs> because for me, it it feels more like it's vignettes as opposed to an actual movie. Mm-hmm. It feels like they don't really know where to go with it. And they don't have like when I looked at when I stopped at one point, I was like, Oh my god, there's 50 minutes of this left. <laughs> Okay. It's a solid I, two hour movie. I was praying yeah. for like, I was praying for an 88 or 89 minute movie. I didn't want, you know, to, to be another 50 minutes of this movie. <laughs> um, you know, it was one of those moments. Like I, I said, and, and, and it's not, again, it's not a bad movie. It's technically, it's well made. You know, you've got a ton of great actors in it. Um, I like the makeup. You, you know, know it was I, cut. It was cut what? 30 minutes. It was the version of this with 30 minutes. Attitude. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> yeah. re- release the baity cut. Yeah, yeah release the baity <laughs> cut. Hashtag <laughs> no. Hashtag release the baity cut right now, please. <laughs> HBO Max, everybody. Which yeah. ironically, I think this is where you can watch it right now, right? Yeah. Which is weird because it's a Disney movie and not on Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't understand it. They don't <laughs> claim it. They don't claim it. They yeah. don't claim it. The irony is, it wasn't one of Beatty's highest grossing film he ever made. Yes. But I can't help but watch this movie and think, I wish I was looking at the Donald Duck version of this. I said <laughs> Donald mean? Duck. Excuse me. Daffy Duck. Okay. The, the, okay. the cartoon where he, he 
parodies Dick Tracy, like against foes like a racer head and all this. Oh, type of stuff. oh, the great got... piggy bank robbery. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why I couldn't help but think every time I saw this, like, man, I wish I'd seen it. I just had a perverse, like when you said Donald Duck, I just for a minute had like the the George Lucas, like Howard the Duck yeah. jump into my head. Oh, okay. But I was imagining it on like on the set pieces of Dick Tracy. And then yes. it made me uh, and now when you said Great Piggy Bank robbery, though now suddenly I want somebody to make a live action Great Piggy Bank robbery that looks like Dick Tracy and I would Howard love the that. Duck yes. together. I don't know. <laughs> I'm tired, everybody. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I would I would not I would not watch this movie again. I just I got bored. Um, I just found even like even after a while, I'm like, okay, it looks cool, but you know, I mean, it's kind of cool. The point where he he decides to commit murder and murder all those people yeah, yeah. on the streets <laughs> <laughs> while making money. Yes, while yeah. making yeah yeah. I just it just doesn't you know. I mean, it's not you know. I mean. I mean, it's no Miller's Crossing with Tommy Guns. I'll tell oh, you that much. Oh, no. oh, oh. Give, me <laughs> you know, dick, give me that verse. What give, me the, give me the Coen Brothers, Dick Tracy. I'm there all day. <laughs> yes. But, yeah. you know, the man was all, the, the old man was always a master with the Thompson. But, yeah, I, I, it's one of those things where, like I said, I mean, I didn't, I, I, I see why I don't have a nostalgia for this movie. And it's because I just didn't, it's just, it's just I'm like, I got done with it. I'm like, yep, that was a movie. So okay. that's, that, no, that's I, for me. I mean, you know, that's just me. So, I, I mean, I'm I'm with you partially on it. I think I mean, it's not a perfect movie for mm-hmm. like I said, for me, I think three quarters, uh, you know, the script, uh, it feels a little padded three mm-hmm. quarters of the way in. And um, but, you know, we all have those movies, I think, that that are not that we admit are not great, but we all like for some reason. You know what I mean? And and it's I mean, I'm just saying so like mine was was the complete opposite. Like to me, there was a reason why, like when I watched it again. Right. I had never gone back. Right. Because the first time I saw it, I was just sort of like, eh, I don't know. You know what I mean? And going back to what we were talking about in the beginning of the episode, even when I was a kid, I was a little like like kind of sick of the movie anyway, just from a marketing perspective. But now I'm watching it and and like and I see and I see the craft. It's a silly movie. (laughs) <laughs> but I think, but I think it's a silly movie lovingly made. I really do. And like, and, and his love for the character, I think comes through to me anyway. Maybe you too, Clifton. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, no, I do. And I do think like they set out to make a cartoon in live action and, and I think succeeded in that. Cause I remember there's the fight in the shack in the junkyard where it's an exterior shot of just the shack rocking back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> to imply the fight inside. I'm yeah. like, this is totally a cartoon. It's a live action cartoon. Yeah. No, I forgot. That was a shot I forgot about completely. And I mean, and that's early in the movie. And I'm like, oh, yeah. this is really campy compared to like way campier than I remember. With like, the hobo that looks like Marv. Yeah, from anyway, Sin City. Marv from Sin City. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's a lot of fun. Am I going to sit through and watch the whole movie? beginning and no but i'll but there's there's scenes i'll rewatch. there's scenes i thought are great but yeah. i think that goes a little bit to what you're saying frank is that it feels like vignettes but yeah that's a, know, that was my biggest thing was like, nothing I mean, wrong I, with that you know from a, from a story standpoint i'm like oh, okay i mean even even if again even if you'd pushed a little harder and gone a little a little more noir that would have been fine i would have been okay with that um but sort of to be like eh, kind of and then i just feel like it kind of meanders Right. Yeah. You know, you know, other than the, other than, you know, the kid being there to like pull Dick Tracy out of a jam every <laughs> once in a while, mm. as opposed to the, as opposed to the police force he's a part of. Yes. Yes. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. As opposed to the two guys are sitting in the car with him all the time <laughs> that don't really have anything to do, but there's a kid that's going to ride the back of the car. You know, should have got him. Yeah. They should have got him an old school skateboard. So it could have been like Marty McFly and going on the back of the car. But I mean, other than that, like, you know, it's one of those things, again, I just think it's a weird movie because I think it's one of those movies that fits, again, fits in the space of, well, it's PG, but it's not really PG and it's not hard enough to be an R, but we're not, you know, we're not really going to push either side hard enough to be one or the other. I think it's kind of like didn't know where, kind of like didn't know where its lane was it for me. Way. It felt that way to me. Also, yeah. too, I like to add is one of those movies that don't age well due to 4K. Just because of how clear the picture gets, you see the makeup. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. 
like you see i mean i get that with older movies but this one it played off better that you didn't see the stuff behind the curtain you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like what you right. guys yeah. said earlier with the uh the texture matting or whatever i just i just think that there's some people that can see past that stuff and some that can't too. no no yeah but you if know you what i mean yeah, but if you've seen it for the first time, you're like, ah, uh, okay, I see what they <laughs> tried to do, yeah. which is which is different because it's ironic because what Turtles, which is another movie came out this year, that's getting applauded for what it did. Yeah, hopefully we get to discuss that in um just like we did with the spotlight here, but that's the other side of aging in which it 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 instead of it hurting the movie overall, mm -hmm. it helps the movie overall. And I and I hope we discuss it another time. Sure. Yeah. No, I'd say no. I, I I would I would love nothing more than discuss Teenage Mutant Ninja <laughs> Turtles. Uh, do a spotlight on that. But no, I think. But uh, Tommy, I th I think again, I think you're completely right on this. But with the weird camp charm, I think that I think in a weird way that helps this movie too. Okay. Yeah. You know, again, my opinion, but it's just. You know, it's it's not to be made. It's not made to be taken too seriously. Oh, you and can't. So, it, <laughs> no, Definitely no, can't. you can't. But again, I mean, that doesn't take away from the fact that I I think I think it is a labor of love. Also, yeah. Um, I mean, it is it is funny thinking back to how big this movie was, and th and this was you know this this wasn't like the highest grossing movie of that year, but Clifton, like you said, it was in the top ten that year. For sure. I mean, this yeah. this was a successful movie. It was oh, ahead yeah. of Back to the Future Three. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, it is it is a little shocking that there wasn't a sequel made. That's what I thought was really odd too. Is it's one of those movies where I mean, granted, we talked we've we've touched on Batman eighty nine a bunch, but that's one of the things like with with the ending of that movie and the ending of this one. I'm like, what do you, did you just not think there was going to be any call to bring back any of these characters ever? <laughs> You know, I mean, I yeah. guess this is the day. This was the day. I mean, granted, they were franchises then, but they weren't like I guess franchises weren't qu weren't quite as big. I mean, you didn't have, you know, franchises were mostly horror movies. I guess at that time, right. yeah. So, you, so you didn't have a lot of call for we're going to do a, you know Dick Tracy two, or you know whatever. But it's one of those things where I mean, again, it sounded like I mean, I know when I was reading reading about it, they said that at one point he had promised to make the movie for like twenty five million, and it ended up being forty seven. Jeez. So that might have been that might that have sounds been. like that sounds like Warren. My, my understanding of it was, yeah, he had a reputation of of sort of going over budget, right? And and going, I, I guess, like the Jack Nicholson thing, he he wanted a, a percentage of the movie's gross, mm -hmm. okay? Which I think he got. I think it was. A, I I could be wrong. Don't completely quote me on this. I believe he had a percentage end uh deal on this that kicked in if the movie like surpassed 50 million dollars but the caveat of it was is that like if he went for like every million he went over budget it was deducted from like his salary <laughs> right and Jeez. the movie did go over budget the, the oh, movie yeah. went significantly yeah. over budget i think i think at the end of the day it was supposed to be set at like 45 and i think he went like maybe 52 or 53 or something like that um which i mean it, that's peanuts today Oh my sure. god, that is that's nothing. <laughs> it's an egg. Um but in nineteen ninety dollars. Right. In nineteen ninety dollars. Yeah, for sure. No, it's 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 an expensive movie then, but and again, you didn't really have to pay Danny Elfman. You could have just said play the Batman eighty nine <laughs> score. No, and 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 I I read too that Madonna worked for um thirty uh, yeah, for scale. For scale, yeah. basically, yeah, on this. Like she wanted yeah. to do it that much. She did, and she put out an album. They released a single of only her songs that I assume she got all of the money from. Right. Yeah. She got. Like, yeah. I read she got only like thirty five thousand dollars for for doing the part. Yeah. So she did win an Oscar. Well, the the song won an Oscar. I don't know if she won, but I I remember reading that she performed it at the ceremony. Okay. Right. That year, um, Al Pacino was nominated for best supporting actor too. I don't know if we pointed that out or not yet. That, I mean, that's, that's another thing too. He, he, he was nominated in an acting role for this movie. Right. But yeah. That's seven nominations total. Yeah. Three dude. wins. God, it's crazy. <laughs> um, cinematography, mm -hmm. costume oh. design and best sound were the other nominations. Okay. I did, I did see that there was like the, there was attempts to get a sequel made and the movie got kind of stuck in a weird, like rights dispute. 
Mm-hmm. Cause like Warren Beatty was like challenging it or something. I don't, I don't know the exact story of it. I mean, like, you know, you guys can research it more if you want. Uh, but that, that's basically what held it up was I think Warren Beatty retained some, some rights to it or something like that. And there was a little, there was kind of like at a, at a crossroads of what to do with it. And I, I don't, I think it was, I think it was solved like not too, not too, re- not too um, far back. Okay. You know, mm. and, and there's, I, I haven't seen it, but he apparently, I think in 2011, like did a scene or did a special, like a Dick Tracy special. It's weird. Like, like it kind of screams of having to do something with it to keep the rights. Mm-hmm. But like he did <laughs> something with the character where like, he's like, he's interviewed by Leonard Malton, but he's doing it like as Dick Tracy. Right. I read that too. I was like, yeah. what? it's really bizarre. Yeah, it is. So, so, I mean, I think there were, there were, there were plans and I guess when he comes out from hiding every once in a while, like he, he on occasion will say like, I still want to do Dick Tracy too and stuff like that. That's, that's another thing I've, I've read while preparing Mm. for this episode, but so they never did a sequel, but you know, if they did a reboot though, um, do you guys have somebody in mind that you think would play a great Dick Tracy today? Oh no! Well, I don't have someone in mind, but I have two things to add real quick. Be on sure, okay. One, didn't No Face sound a bit like uh, the bounty hunter from Return of the Jedi? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yes, a little bit. Like 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 Princess Leia in yeah, yeah. Princess yeah. Leia disguised as a bounty hunter in Jabba's palace. Yeah, yes. Yes. yeah, yes. it did. That's, that was that creeped me out for a minute because if it two did, women right. disguised and they sound the same, it just, mm-hmm. it just creeped me out for a minute. But no, instead of thinking about uh, a good actor to play Warren Beatty's role, I would love it if Sean Black did a did the um version of it. or Shane Black, not Sean Black. Shane Black, Shane yeah. Black. I would, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shane. Shane, Shane Black's Dick Tracy. I'd watch yes. that. Okay. I'd watch, yes, yes, that'd be amazing. I think so too. Yeah, I would love right. it if he directed. Sure, I'll go. Why not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So okay, but who who would play him in in Shane Black's? Uh, Dick Tracy. <laughs> oh, it had to be a, um, what's his name? God, Gladiator, Russell Crowe. Oh, I thought <laughs> I thought you were gonna say Robert Downey. Oh no 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 Russell Crowe Russell, man Russell Crowe. Oh yeah, really? Oh yeah, it, it, it give an excuse to beat people up. You kidding me? Oh, it's man. like LA Confidential. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> or give the me. good guys. Yes. My- oh, the good guys. Yes. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, that was a God. Shane Black movie. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, that's yeah. why I said it. Yeah, that's yeah. why I said it. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> Russell oh, would be, be awesome as Dick Tracy. That'd be he a would... psycho Dick Tracy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just punching people. Are you kidding me? He wouldn't say <laughs> much. Okay. God. Who wants to go next? I mean, I can't think of it, anyone who I think would be in it. I just try to picture like what they would do as a Dick Tracy now, because I don't think we'd get that. We would not get that artificial artificiality. No. And and I just wonder like how straight they would try to play it. Yeah. And would if they get like would like, they do a modern Dick Tracy take? as Michael Mann's Miami Vice or right. something? <laughs> <laughs> well, Clifford, do you think that they would try to have some kind of explanation why all the villains were had deformities? I don't even know <laughs> if they would do that. I mean, would they say like, you know, where they where they grew up in that part of town there was some kind of toxic right, waste like dump? the like the deconstructed explanation? Yes. I, <laughs> I don't know. Um but the have any would be you, amazing. Have any of you guys <laughs> seen the trailer for HBO's um, Perry Mason? It's it's it makes me laugh every time I see it. <laughs> really? Yeah. That, that's that's exactly what I think a modern day Dick Tracy would look yeah, like. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Is, is that <laughs> is that yeah, movie? But no, I laugh every time I see it because I'm like well, Perry Mason was uh was a wasn't he a lawyer? Wasn't yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. 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 He wasn't Perry a Mason's PI. A this seems almost like they're trying to do my camera, but instead they're doing Perry Mason. Yeah. And Perry Mason, like he did in the early old Perry Masons, he kind of was like a lawyer slash private eye. Yeah. Okay. Like there was a lot of stuff of him digging and and finding evidence and getting people to testify and stuff. I just, I just remember the Raymond Bird like show. That's why I was kind of like, eh, I don't really know if I. I mean, I can't say what I can't speak to it because it was a law drama type thing that I didn't watch. So right. It I'll always go. ended in the courtroom. Oh yeah, okay. God. <laughs> I think okay. it looks kind of cool, but I'm with you. It, like, it, 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 like I, I'm shocked it's not called like Perry Mason Rises or something like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Perry Mason begins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So I, if, if I had to cast someone today, I would probably go with Army Hammer. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. Interesting. I like to, I really enjoy, you know, as much as I, you know, as I get on my rant of like, this is a Disney movie. I have that moment <laughs> with, with Lone Ranger. I still think Army Hammer is like, you know, an upstanding character where I think it was a good Lone Ranger. I just think it was kind of an odd movie for being a Disney movie. But I think Army Hammer. He's Ham- a good actor. But I think Army, yeah, I think he's a very good actor and I think he would be very good as Dick Tracy playing it, you know, you know, very, very much of a, a lawman straight part would be fine. Either him and, and or if they're playing it just a little bit goofy, I'd go with, with uh, John Hamm. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. I think oh, John Hamm, one. I think John Hamm as Dick Tracy would be pretty funny. Have you yeah. seen the man? Have you seen the man from Uncle? I have not still not have seen that. That, that, that was my pick. Yeah. No, oh, not Army Hammer, but uh, Cavill. Oh, Henry yeah. Cavill would Cavill's be would good. be would be. I, I have three. Really it depends what you do. <laughs> if, you, if you're if you're doing the gritty, Dick Tracy, I'd say John Bernthal. Dick begins. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're, do, if you're doing. <laughs> He was, oh my god, he'll be slaughtering people. Uh, oh I my say god. John Bernthal, Bern- but if wait, 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 you said Bernthal, yeah. yes. I, I mean, I love Bernthal. I think he's amazing. He's such a good actor. He's so, but I mean, it would be a lot of it'd be a Dick Tracy who touches his face every two seconds. Well, <laughs> he'd be exasperated <laughs> a lot, yeah. Because that's, I mean, that's, I mean, that's his, that's his thing. You know, when he starts to get mental, he touches his face. So, I'm for it. But like I, mean, I said, <laughs> if you're doing the gritty Dick Tracy, that's who I go. I could lie to you. I get. I, I mean, I could definitely see him in the yellow trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. I'd watch that. If and if we're doing a, like like a comedic kind of kind of kitschy version, uh-huh. like like we got, I say Henry Cavill, or uh, I say Simon Pegg. I think Simon Pegg would have a ton of fun. Simon <laughs> Pegg. Oh, yeah. he's too old. He's too old. Ah, who cares? Pegg would be too old. <laughs> no, no. It's just no. I just I just see him. Trying to beat up people. That's, yeah, that's, 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 it'd be <laughs> funny. That's what I'm saying. Oh my God. Why don't you put Ricky Gervais in it while you're yeah, at ba- it? <laughs> Will Ferrell. Well, there we go. Yeah. Will Ferrell. Ricky, Ricky Gervais is Dick Tracy. I'd watch. He's. Oh. Okay. Right, so what's your What's your third then, Zach? No, that was that was my third. Oh, that was your third. Yeah, oh, wow. Simon, okay. Simon Pegg was my right. third. Yeah. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. So that's Dick Tracy, everybody. Check it out on HBO Max. Uh, it's def- it's fun. It's, it was it's, a movie. <laughs> yeah. It was definitely a movie. <laughs> it's a fun movie, I think. Uh, anyway, okay. So um, you guys can be a part of the conversation in the comments section where you guys can tell us your memories and thoughts of Dick Tracy. We'd love to hear them. Also, we take topic suggestions. So if you want to leave a topic that you would like to have us discuss, go ahead and leave a suggestion in the comment section and we just might use it on the air. Please check out our website at letmenowhowitis.com where you can catch up on all of our past episodes as well as find notes, links, and examples to some of the things we bring up in conversation. You can also find a link to our YouTube page there as well. And finally, don't forget to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash letmenowhowitis and follow us on Twitter at our show's initials, L-M-K-H-I-I. Thanks for listening and we will see you on the next one. <laughs>